Welcome to the LACNETS Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Yen. I'm the LACNETS Director of Programs and Outreach, as well as a caregiver and advocate for my husband who is living with NET. In each podcast episode, we talk to a NET expert who answers your top 10 questions. This podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Please discuss your questions and concerns with your physician. Welcome to the LACNETS Podcast. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Gary Uliner, who joins us from Southern California to discuss the imaging of NETS. Dr. Uliner is the James and Pamela Musi Endowed Chair of Molecular Imaging and Therapy at the Hogue Family Cancer Institute. He is the Professor of Radiology and Translational Genomics at the Keck School of Medicine, University of Southern California. Dr. Uliner was previously with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he trained under Dr. Lisa Baudet, who is well known to us here at LACNETS. And Dr. Uliner served as the PET CT expert on the breast cancer disease management team. Dual board certified in radiology and nuclear medicine, Dr. Uliner is a nationally recognized expert in the use of targeted imaging to help direct focus cancer therapies. Dr. Uliner completed his medical degree and a PhD in cancer biology at Stanford University School of Medicine, an internship at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and his radiology and nuclear medicine residencies at the University of Southern California. A fun fact about Dr. Uliner is that he is a competitive West Coast swing dancer. How cool is that? Welcome, Dr. Uliner. We're excited to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lisa. And uh, yeah, West Coast Swing is the state dance of California. Go ahead and Google and uh, look it up. Uh, absolutely phenomenal dance. And I have to say, I'm so excited to be here today because my six-year-old son, uh, Ilya, listens to a podcast of Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Star Talk. And I'm so, I'm just thrilled to be able to tell him that I'm doing a uh, podcast like his favorite person now. Oh, that's awesome. So now you're going to elevate in his eyes, your level of coolness in his eyes. We shall see. We shall see. (laughs) Okay. Well, in our podcast, it is kind of cool because we are tackling 10 of the top questions in your field of expertise. So as we know, I mean, you're an expert in many things, but diagnostic imaging is one of them. And there's many questions that our population and our listeners have in this area. So let's first tackle this area of functional imaging. So our first question for you today is, what is the difference between a dotatate PET CT scan and an FDG PET scan? And if you could explain what those are, or the other types of PET scans that are commonly ordered for other types of cancers. Absolutely, Lisa. Let me start by saying there's a difference between functional imaging and anatomic imaging. Anatomic imaging would be seeing structure. Kind of like you look at a look out the window and you see a tree and it will have roots under the ground and it will have a trunk and it has uh, leaves and flowers. So when you do anatomic imaging, you're looking at those individual structures and those things could be CT scans or MR scans, ultrasound scans, different ways of looking at that anatomy. Now, a functional scan tells you what's happening inside those structures. So when you look at a tree, you can't see that there's constantly photosynthesis occurring within the leaves. You can't see that there's constantly water being drawn up through the roots and evaporating through the leaves. So a tree that's alive and a tree that just recently died look exactly the same on anatomic imaging, whereas it looks entirely different on if you were doing like a functional imaging of what's happening through water or oxygen or molecules within the tree. The same thing within the human body. Anatomic imaging, we can do a CT scan or an MR scan in order to say, this is the liver, this is the lung, these are the bones, and be able to look for abnormalities within the liver, the lung, the bones, masses. But functional imaging, allows you to see what's happening in those organs, what's happening in those masses, because a mass that represents a treated tumor could look absolutely the same as an active growing tumor on anatomic imaging. Functional imaging scans allow you to say, ah, this is a living, breathing, or not really breathing, but living tumor that needs to be dealt with versus 
this is an already treated and dead tumor, which is no longer a danger to you. So in the category of functional imaging, the most common PET scan is called uh, an FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan. And this is a radio labeled sugar molecule. Lots of tumors like to eat sugar. Neuroendocrine tumors eat sugar, particularly if they're poorly differentiated. So we can see neuroendocrine tumors and we can see how active they are by using an FDG PET scan. Now there's something also called a dotatate PET scan. This is a different type of PET scan that looks for something called a somatostatin receptor. So neuroendocrine tumors express different types of somatostatin receptors and the dotatate binds to that somatostatin receptor and then shows us where the somatostatin receptor is present within the body. So for example, that anatomic imaging, like a CT scan, if I see a mass in the liver, and then we do the dotatate PET scan in January, we can see that that tumor expresses lots of somatostatin receptors. And then the patient gets treatment in February, and then we repeat the scans in March. The CT scan may show very little difference but the DOTA PET scan can show you, ah, all the cancer cells have been killed because the somatostatin receptors are no longer expressed. There's still a mass, but it's not living, metabolizing tumor cells in that mass anymore. So often these functional imaging scans provide much more important information than anatomic imaging scans. And perhaps the best is when you combine anatomic imaging together with functional imaging in order to get the best answers. So when we say someone has a dotatate PET CT, they're getting a functional kind of dotatate, a molecular imaging dotatate PET, as well as an anatomic CT scan. And when we say they're getting an FDG PET CT, they're getting a measure of metabolism through the FDG PET scan, and then a measure of anatomy through the CT scan. And patients with neuroendocrine tumors can have many different functional or molecular imaging studies like dotatate and FDG, as well as many different anatomic imaging studies like CT and MR uh, throughout the course of monitoring their disease. Thank you for that. I feel like we just got a primer on anatomic and functional imaging, and that, I really appreciate the way that you explain it so clearly. So the second question is, what is the difference between the gallium-68 dotatate and then the newer copper-64 dotatate scans? And if there's one that has benefits over the other, what would that be? And should I be getting a copper-64 scan now that it's out? Understood. Thanks, Lisa. So if we try and break down these PET agents like dotatate, these molecules, I try and picture, picture a, a key, all right? And... Uh, the key has a part of the key that has all the ridges on it, right? That is what specifies what lock does the key bind to. And then the key on the other end often has like a hole or something that you can attach a keychain or something else onto it. So to design these different pet agents, you have to mix and match the part of the key that binds into the lock and what you attach onto the key. So Tate, right, the Tate part of the molecule is that part of the key that binds to the lock. It's a specific structure that binds to the somatostatin receptors on the cancer cells. So anytime you're using Tate, you can bind to the somatostatin receptors and bind where the neuroendocrine tumor cells are. DOTA is a linker that allows you to attach the tape to something that emits radioactivity, right? Gallium-68 and copper-64 are two molecules that emit positrons. So the tape localizes you to the tumor, and then either the gallium-68 or this copper-64 emits the positrons, and the positrons are what we see in the uh, actually, the positrons annihilate. It gets a little more complicated, but bottom line, the positrons would allow you to see where the neuroendocrine tumors are in your PET scanner. 
So the real difference between the gallium-68 dotatate and the copper-64 dotatate is what's the difference between gallium-68 and copper-64? Because the dotatate is the same. The positrons that are emitted from copper-64 are slightly lower energy than gallium-68, and that could be an advantage because the lower the energy, the shorter the distance these positrons move before we said they kind of and they annihilate when they hit an electron. So the lower the energy, the shorter the positrons move, the tighter focus, what we call resolution, you can get on the images. So you can get more precise measure a localization of where the tumors are. But really we're on the talking about the orders of fractions of a millimeter. So when you say that copper 64 has this advantage over gallium 68, through the physics, yes, it's an advantage. Does that translate into a real clinical benefit for patients? No one has ever shown that. So for all intents and purposes, I find the gallium 68 and the copper 64 to provide equal quality imaging for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Now for hospitals, there's one other difference between copper 64 and gallium 68 that is a factor, and that copper 64 has a longer half-life. And that makes it easier for the hospital to order and schedule patients. If there's a delay, the copper 64 won't have decayed as much as the gallium uh, 68. But again, in most scenarios and where we are, what I see at the Hogue Family Cancer Institute is that we can reliably schedule patients. We're not commonly delayed. So for all intents and purposes, gallium 68 dotatate and copper 64 dotatate provide the same information that you need about neuroendocrine tumors. So do you need to get one or the other? I don't believe so. I believe either are essentially equivalent value for imaging the somatostatin receptors in neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. And just as a follow-up with that, if, if I've already gotten gallium-68 dotatates, should I get another gallium-68 dotatate or is it better to switch over to a copper-64? I don't think it's a matter, I don't think you need to switch from one to the other. In my experience, it's always better to compare apples to apples when you're doing follow-up scans. So if you've had one of them in January and you're getting your follow-up scan in April, get the same scan because that's gonna be the most reliable to compare them together. I don't think either one is essentially better than the other. Once you start using one, continue using the same one that provides the easiest comparison among different time points. Thank you for that. Yeah, and we always want to have the best comparison with apples to apples, like you said. So the third question is, I've been hearing more about Dota Talk in the USA, where in the past I've only heard it from European specialists. What is this? What is Dota Talk? And are there advantages to Dota Talk versus Dota Tate? In addition, what is Dota knock as well? Great. So if we go back to our little key analogy, Tate is a key, right? It has ridges that binds into a lock. And then Tak is a slightly different key. It has slightly different ridges, so it binds a little differently. And the same thing for knock. These are all three molecules that bind to somatostatin receptors. Now, the most common somatostatin receptors in neuroendocrine tumors tend to be like these, you talk about types two and type five, and there's different extents of binding of TAC, Tate, and NOC to these different somatostatin receptors. So for any individual patient, it may turn out that TAC or Tate or NOC is slightly better than the other one. It might give you slightly higher sensitivity for detecting an individual tumor site. Now in the United States, Tate, and more specifically gallium 68 Dota Tate, was the first one that was FDA approved. So that was the one that people talked about most in the United States. And now we're seeing that gallium 68 Dota Talk is FDA approved. 
So do I think that any one of these is superior to the others? It's like, you know, we're mixing and matching different keys, different portions that bind to the lock and different attachments to the key that emit positrons. Again, for, for most purposes, these molecules will have nearly equal sensitivity. When you look at a large population of patients with neuroendocrine tumors for finding sites of disease. In any individual patient, one might work better than another, although you're not going to know that before you get scanned with all three of the agents. And in general, you're just going to get scanned with one because all three of them have relatively similar sensitivity. So again, if you're interested in having Dotatoc, you can have that the most common we used a somatostatin agent in the United States is dotatate and in the United States. And uh, I find that one to be highly sensitive and valuable for the vast majority of patients. And then again, as soon as you start using one imaging method, stick with it because there can be slight differences between TOC and Tate and NOC. And when you've been treated, again, going that analogy, January to April, if you get two scans of the same agent, then you can make a really apples to apples comparison. Whereas if you use one in January and a different one in April, the question becomes how much has really changed in your tumor versus how much is the change due to you using a different agent? So all of the agents are good and stick with one agent over your course of multiple scans. That's really helpful just to have that guideline to try to stick to the same agent with all of the changes out there. And we like to see and hear that there are changes in development, but it can feel overwhelming on the patient end. So thank you for that. So the next question, we hear a lot about SUVs. So what are SUV values? What do they mean on dotatate PET CT scans? And does it translate to a more familiar measurement like millimeters or centimeters? Or inches, right? Or uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, it was a two point five four centimeters to the inch. You got to get the metric and uh, old, old English method. Okay, SUV stands for standardized uptake value, and this is a measure of it's like a ratio of how much of the tracer is in a particular lesion versus how much of the tracer was administered to the patient. So you can imagine if the tracer is concentrating in one lesion, the SUV is higher. And if there's relatively less concentration in one lesion, then the SUVs are lower. This is not something that you should directly compare to like a size measurement, millimeters or centimeters. And this goes back to that difference between functional and anatomic imaging that we talked about, right? I can look at that tree out my window, right? And all the leaves look the same. I can measure them. This one is three centimeters. This one's 2.9 centimeters. This one's 2.8 centimeters. But let's say one leaf is really not a lot, is dead, right? And the other two leaves are functional. They're working. They're undergoing photosynthesis. And I put something in the tree's food in the soil, right, that's a, a radioactive. So it, that is going to undergo photosynthesis. So when I look at those three leaves, I can say this one's three centimeters, this one's 2.8 centimeters. But when I measure how much photosynthesis is occurring in each leaf, one leaf is zero and one leaf could be 80, right? So that's your real comparison of of a size measurement like centimeters to a functional measurement like SUV. So in a human patient with a neuroendocrine tumor, if I have a PET CT scan, I could say this liver lesion on the left measures three centimeters and this liver lesion on the right measures 2.8 centimeters. But then when I measure the SUV on the dotatate scan, I can say the lesion on the left has no somatostatin receptor in it. The lesion on the right has a lot of somatostatin, active somatostatin receptor in it. Or if I'm doing an FDG PET scan, I could say the lesion on the left 
is not using any glucose. It's metabolically inert. It's not functional. And the lesion on the right has an SUV of whatever, 15, whatever the number turns out to be. That lesion is active. It's alive. It needs to be taken care of. So SUVs, the higher the SUV value, that means the more tracer is accumulating in the lesion compared to the amount of tracer that you've administered into the patient's bloodstream versus centimeters, which is just a measure of, of size. And again, I like to say that a lesion that's alive versus a lesion that's dead can look exactly the same and have the same size measurements, but they can have drastically different SUV values on these dotatate or FTG PET scans. Thank you for that. You're taking us back to our high school biology classes with your photosynthesis metaphor there. Um, if I could ask a follow-up question about the SUV values, I guess what, if any, ideal SUV values are there or would you want there to be? This kind of comes up a lot in our support group and in our webinars as well. There's no one right answer to that question. It all depends upon what your purpose of doing the scan was. Let's say we're talking about FDG PET scans, right? And uh, before your treatment, your three liver lesions measured 10, 11, and 12. What you want after treatment is for those lesions to measure uh, one, two, and three, right? You, you want the SUVs to have dropped dramatically after treatment because that means the tumor is not eating glucose, is not metabolizing. The tumor has been well treated. For a dotatate PET scan, you might have an entirely different purpose. The SUV on dotatate scans help predict how well you're going to respond to therapies like ludotherapy. So when you do a dotatate PET before uh, treatment and the SUV is two in a liver lesion, you might say, mm, uh, liver lesion's not taking up my dotatate. It's probably not going to take up my lutathera. So it's probably not going to be treated well by lutathera. So before these neuroendocrine therapies like lutathera, you kind of want the SUVs on a dotatate PET scan to be as high as possible because that tells you that the ridge part of the key is fits into the lock of the tumor really well so that the treatment is gonna to get to the tumor really well. So uh, bottom line, there is no right answer for what you want the SUV number to be. It depends upon what is the situation that you're currently in and what you're evaluating. That's helpful. So if I'm understanding this correctly, for an FDG PET scan, you want low or no numbers <laughs> on that. But for a dotatate PET or dotatop or any of those other dota scans, you want it to be as high as possible. Well, before for the dotatate before dota talk, before treatment with Ludothera, you want the SUVs to be as high as possible because that tells you that your Ludothera is going to hit its target really well. And for FDG, it's not as much the number, it's kind of the change right? So if an SUV of five doesn't tell you as much as an SUV of 20 dropping to five, because if a patient goes from an SUV of 20 before therapy to an SUV of five after therapy on an FDG PET scan, that means the therapy worked really well. If the patient went from an SUV of three before the therapy to an SUV of five after therapy, then that therapy didn't work well. So the, the absolute number may be less important than the changes that are occurring before and after therapy. That's helpful. So what about after Ludothera? What would you like to see um, happen with the Dota Tate scans in terms of that? That's a great question. And it's a really complicated question, unfortunately, because the Dota Tate scan sees the somatostatin reception. So you can, they're really, after therapy, when you see like, let's say that the SUV on a dotatate scan was 20 on a lesion before therapy. And then after the therapy, the SUV is five. Well, there are two potential interpretations of that. Number one is that the therapy worked and there's less tumor, right? That makes sense. But the other potential interpretation is 
the tumor is still there, but it's losing its somatostat receptors. And when it loses its somatostat receptors, it tends to get more aggressive. So that could be bad. So whereas with FDG, the change in FDG before and after therapy really gives you a really reliable measure of is the tumor getting well-treated or not well-treated, changes in, in somatostatin receptor agents like dotatate before and after treatment are not as reliable because you don't know which of those two processes are dominating. That's why, so with the dotatate scan, that tends to be done prior to Lutathera in order to make sure that Lutathera is going to be effective, right? If your SUVs are really low on the dotatate scan, then they're not going to prescribe the Lutathera. Why should you get a treatment with side effects if you're not going to get, if it's not going to hit the target and give you benefit? But there's less work done on measuring treatment response, right? Before and after treatment with dotatate. I find that FDG has been the most reliable of the radio tracers for measuring treatment response before and after treatment. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, this is an area that there's a lot of confusion. So hopefully that kind of helps clear up some of the confusion. And you've really give us a good, uh, very good, clear explanations here. So if we could move on to anatomic imaging scans, and you've already kind of explained a little bit of the general category. The next question is, what is the difference between the CT scan in a dotate PET CT scan and a regular, in quotes, a CT scan that might be ordered? Got it. So let's talk about a CT scan without the dotate PET or the, that quote unquote regular scan. That scan, which some people call a diagnostic quality CT scan, uh, there's no one uniform term yet. I wish maybe there was one because no, no one term best describes it. But essentially the standard CT scan that's done on its own is done with ample amount of penetrating radiation to give you very exquisitely detailed images of bone, soft tissues, lung, and where the lesions are in those images. So you optimize the amount of radiation that's used in order to get really good images. That's number one. Number two is those scans are often done with what's called intravenous contrast. And that contrast goes into your bloodstream so you can see the vessels really well. And then tumors often have increased blood flow. So the contrast helps you see tumors, right? And then third, that CT scan is usually done with the patient holding their breath. When you take a deep breath, you hold it and the scan's done while you're holding your breath. And that's the best way to get pictures of your lungs because when your breath is, is held, you can get really, really excellent resolution of small lung nodules that could be metastases. Now, when you do a dotatate PET CT scan, you may use some of those three things, or you may use none of them. So let's talk about the kind of the standard dotatate PET CT. Number one, we use lower dose radiation on the CT, so we don't get such exquisitely detailed pictures. And we do that because the CT component of that PET CT is being used for a few things, namely to optimize the FDG PET or the dotatate PET. So you're trying to see the lesions with the FDG or the dotatate, not necessarily with the CT scan. So we use a lower dose of radiation. Second, it may not be done with intravenous contrast. So it's a non-contrast CT. And again, the contrast sometimes helps you see lesions, but you're using the dotatate or the FDG to see the lesions, not the intravenous contrast. And finally, a PET CT scan on a typical scanner these days takes 8, 12, 15 minutes, you can't hold your breath that long. So PET CT scans are done with free breathing, not with a breath hold, and that makes it harder to see small little nodules in the lung. So a standalone PET CT is done optimally to see lesions. The dotatate PET CT makes some sacrifices in the quality of the CT in order to optimize the PET side of the equation. Sometimes you can get 
a PET CT scan that tries to optimize both sides, right? And you can never get 100%. You can use full radiation dose on the CT scan, and you can use intravenous contrast on the CT scan, but you can never, you can't do breath hold on a PET CT scan unless there are these really modern scanners that only one or two places have that can take pictures in a matter of seconds instead of a matter of minutes. So you can hold your breath that long, or you're one of these surface divers that dives for pearls and you're able to hold your breath for 12 minutes. So you generally, you can't get the best of both worlds all the time. But I like to do my PET CTs with as close to optimal CT performance as possible. And that includes using the full radiation dose and using intravenous contrast so that you get the best quality CT that you can get as well as the best quality FDG or dotatate PET that you can get. Oh, wow, that's really helpful. We definitely don't want people passing out in the CT scanner. And so definitely trying to optimize the scan for whatever the purpose is. So this kind of, this next question ties into what you're already kind of touching on is, so what type of CT scan should be done to evaluate NET? And should a CT scan be done with contrast? And if so, what type of contrast? So for a CT scan, the contrasts are iodine-based. And again, this is to help visualize differences in tissues as best you can. I like CTs done with intravenous contrast. It's not always performed that way, nor is it always needed that way. For example, if you have a patient with lymph node, liver, and lung metastases that are really dotatate avid, right, on that scan in January, and you want to see treatment response in April, then a dotate PET CT that doesn't optimize the CT is probably more than enough, right? Because if the dotate PET is giving you the majority of your information, then you just optimize the dotate PET side. For patients who are initially diagnosed with neuroendocrine tumors, I like to make sure that patients get a intravenous contrast enhanced scan as part of their initial workup because you can sometimes see lesions on the CT um, that for whatever reason you don't see on the PET, whether they express somatostatin receptors really poorly so they don't show up on the dotatate PET or whether they're not very metabolically active so they don't show up on the FDG PET. Sometimes you can see lesions on a contrast-enhanced CT or an MR that don't show up on the PET scan, and therefore, at initial diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor, patients should have, I think, at least one functional imaging scan and one well-performed anatomic imaging scan. And then again, like a PET CT, those can be performed at the same time if you're doing your dotatate PET CT with a full radiation dose and intravenous contrast. So do you need to have IV contrast? Depends upon the individual situation. At initial diagnosis, I highly recommend you get at least one anatomic imaging with intravenous contrast. Follow-up scans, it depends whether your tumor was better seen on the PET or on the CT. If you have a tumor that wasn't seen on the PET, then obviously you wanna optimize your CT. If you have a tumor that was best seen on the PET, then you probably want to optimize the PET and you don't necessarily have to optimize the CT component on your follow-up post-treatment scans. Thank you. That's really helpful. I know that comes up a lot about whether or not you should have contrast. So thank you for explaining that. And a follow-up question to that, people have heard this term triple phase CT scan. What is that? And how do we know if we are having this type of scan? Got it. So the phase refers to the point in time after you administer intravenous contrast. So for a standard CT scan with contrast, they will give the IV contrast and then they take the pictures maybe 30, 40 seconds later when the contrast has had enough time to get into, uh, let me back up a second there and say they put the IV contrast into a vein in your arm, right? Let's think about what happens to that contrast. 
the contrast is in your vein. It travels back to your heart, so it's in your venous system, and then your heart pumps it out into your arterial system, right? And the arterial system goes out to all your organs, into the capillaries, and then from the capillaries, it gets sent back into your venous system again, right? The blood is constantly going veins to arteries, from your heart to the arteries, through your capillaries, back into the veins, and then back into your heart. So depending upon how long you wait after you administer the intravenous contrast, you will see different things. You will see different places that this contrast is in your bloodstream. So when someone does a triple phase CT, typically that means they're scanning in the arterial phase first when the contrast is in the arteries, and then in the venous phase a little later, maybe 30, 40 seconds later, when the contrast has moved through the capillaries and back into your veins. And then finally in a delayed phase, which could be minutes after that, and the contrast is now being extruded into your kidneys. Alternatively, triple phase could mean the first phase is before I give the contrast at all. So it's a non-contrast CT. And then the second phase is that arterial phase. And the third phase is the uh, venous phase. And then some people will talk about four phase CTs, right? And that's all of it. Before you give the contrast one, arterial phase two, venous phase three, and delayed phase four. And depending again upon what is the individual application of that scan, you might do one or two, three, or four different phases. Neuroendocrine tumors are kind of special in that they are often visualized best on the arterial phase. So while most cancers are best visualized on the venous phase, neuroendocrine tumors are often, but not always, best visualized on the arterial phase. So for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, patients often get scanned at multiple points in time. That's this triple phase or quadruple phase in order to see what each different point in time can show. You get that least that arterial phase when the cancers are often best seen and a venous phase when other things of importance can be best seen, like other benign lesions that need to be excluded from being cancer. And then you might do a phase before the contrast is administered. That helps you document where calcifications are in the body because after you give the contrast, the calcifications can be confused with contrast. And if you have a pre-contrast phase, then I can say, ah, this really bright white stuff, that is not my contrast because I haven't given the contrast yet. That must be something calcified or something else. And then the delayed phase, the fourth phase is most common for visualizing lesions that are in the genitourinary tract, like the kidneys, the ureter, and the bladder. So when they say triple phase CT, that means they're giving you a bolus of contrast and they're putting you through the CT scanner multiple times at different time points in order to see where the contrast is at those different time points. Wow, that's really helpful. And how would the patients know if they're having this type of scan? Uh, you, you move through the scanner more than once. <laughs> right? okay. So when you're sitting on the scanner, they often will put you through quickly once, and that is what they call their scout. They line up where you, they need to visualize, say they're going to scan your chest, your abdomen, and your pelvis. They get their landmarks of where you're going to go through the scan. It tends to be a, the quickest part of the pass through the machine. In a second or two, you've, you've done your scout. Then if you go through the machine one more time, you've only had data captured at one phase. If you go through the machine two more times, then they, they captured two sets of data. And if they go through the scan three times, then that's your triple phase CT. And also you just time it with, you, patients know <laughs> when you get intravenous contrast, right? If you've ever had intravenous contrast, you can feel it going into your arm, 
you tend to get this flushed, warm feeling all over your body. So if they send you through the scan before they do the IV contrast once, and then they send you through the scanner twice after they give you the IV contrast, well, there's your three phase or, or triple phase CT. That's really helpful. Okay, so if you've lived through it, you kind of know, and you can count the number of times you've been through the scan. Yeah, how many times do they send you through the scanner? Yeah, yeah. Well, what if you're not the person and you're a loved one? Um, would you be able to see it on the report or on the order? Under the method section, most reports have a very similar structure. They start with saying what the scan is at the very top. This is a you know CT of the abdomen and pelvis, or they say this is a dotate PET CT. Sometimes they'll even say in the header, this is a three-phase CT of the abdomen or pelvis. But certainly just under that, there'll be a method section where they explain what they did. And they'll say in there for a three-phase CT, they'll say the patient was scanned through the chest, abdomen, and pelvis before IV contrast, in the arterial phase, and in the venous phase. And that's your three phases. That's really helpful. Okay. Thank you for that. So now we know where to look on the reports as well. So we've talked about PET scans. We've talked a lot about CT scans. And now moving on to MRIs, what is the difference between CT and MRI? And what type of MRI scan should be done to evaluate NET? Excellent. So CT scan measures density. Actually, it measures something called attenuation, which is the amount of radiation that is absorbed as as the radiation passes through your body. But I think it can be simplified by thinking of it as density. Bones are denser than soft tissue. Soft tissue is denser than air or gas, right? So you can see bones from liver, from lung, through the different densities on a CT scan. And that's how the CT scan works, based on density. MR is based on magnetic moments. If you've ever been in an MR scanner, it's really loud, (laughs) right? You hear this. Now, what that is, is the magnet. What they do is your body is in itself a really weak magnet. Your water molecules have a slight magnetic moment. And each water molecule is facing in a different direction. So in total, your magnetic moment is zero but each individual water molecule has a little magnetic moment. So the MR scanner using a really powerful magnet lines up all those molecules, water molecules in one orientation. And then you are essentially a little magnet, right? And when the magnet stops working, those water molecules, they go from being all orderly to going back to being disorderly over time. And as they're flipping back to being disorderly, you lose your magnetic poles. And the MR can distinguish tissues based on how long it takes these magnetic poles to dissipate. So an MR sees things differently than a CT scanner, right? The CT scanner is seeing things through density. The MR is seeing things through these magnetic poles. And it's complicated, but I think it can be incompletely suboptimally, but a nice summary would be that the CT is better than the MR in seeing the bones and the lung, whereas the MR is better than the CT at discriminating different soft tissues. So the MR can see, the MR can see liver nodules in the liver with a greater sensitivity than the CT scan. CT can. So if you might, you you imagine if your normal liver has a density that we call 100, right? And then a nodule appears, right? That this is a metastasis. You you want to detect this. But the density of the nodule is only, you know, we measure it to be 99 or, or 98. We may not be able to distinguish, right, to discriminate those small differences on the CT scan until the nodule gets much bigger. And then we can say, ah, now my eye or a computer algorithm can discriminate that, yes, there's a nodule here that's different from the rest of the liver. The MR scan is much more sensitive 
for finding things in structures like the liver. So if there is concern, for example, if we do a CT scan or a PET scan or a PET CT scan, and we say, hmm, there might be a lesion here in the liver, but I'm not sure, the next step is to get an MR because the MR will be able to tell us more definitively, yep, something's there, or uh, nope, that was just some, some background noise. So MR and CT are both anatomic imaging methods. They image using different physical methods, and they each have strengths and weaknesses where the CT tends to be better for the bone and the lungs, and the MR tends to be better for the soft tissues and the CT scan. And that makes the MR the preferred imaging modality at the preferred anatomic imaging modality for things like the liver and the brain. That's really helpful. You have a remarkable way of breaking things down in a way that is easy to understand. So we've talked a lot about contrast with the CT scan. What about with an MRI? Should an MRI be done with contrast? And if so, what kind of contrast? It all comes down to the application. For most cancer applications, MRs should be done with intravenous contrast. The contrasts are different than the contrast that they give for CT. Again, for CT, it tends to be based on iodine. For MR, they use agents that help optimize these magnetic uh, signals that we can get from the MR. Uh, terms uh, for MR contrasts are like gadivist, magnivist, evist. And for CT scans, essentially all these IV contrasts are the same. For MR, there is an important difference between EOVIST and the other types of MR contrasts. EOVIST has the advantage of being excreted through the liver. So a uh, normal liver takes up the EOVIST really well. So that's something that can be used to help visualize things that are not supposed to be in the liver, like metastases. On delayed phase images, right, we talked about these phases, arterial phase, venous phase, delayed phases. On a more delayed phase image, the liver should have some EOVIST in it, whereas a metastasis in general does not. So EOVIST helps visualize liver metastases to an extent that's a little greater than other MR contrast media. So then again, should you be getting intravenous contrast for an MR scan? Depends on the application. For most oncologic applications, if you're trying to see a tumor, yes, you should have IV contrast for an MR scan. And then which MR contrast agent should you be getting? Just know that EOVIS provides a more sensitive evaluation for liver metastases than the other MR intravenous contrast agents. Okay, so it sounds like EOVIS is the contrast of choice for the liver, is what you're saying? I believe so, yes. Okay. That, is my, that is my opinion. And I think that is a predominant opinion among people who, when they're choosing contrast agents, if you have liver metastases, EOVIS is a little superior to other IV contrast agents for MR. Okay, thank you for that. And again, now we've talked about CTs and MRIs and PET scans, how concerned should patients be with radiation safety, given that they're getting all these scans, CT, MRI, dotatate, and then also PRT. You and I know probably um, that there are patients who tally the amount of radiation they get over a lifetime. So how concerned should they be? Great question. Um, and a question that we are often responding to. Now, I approach this from two different uh, points of view. Number one is the principle in uh, medical imaging called ALARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable, which means we try and keep radiation to an absolute minimum. Now, the reason we do that is because there's evidence from people who have had lots of radiation, you know, atomic bomb survivors, that these patients have higher cancer risks in the future, right? So if you've been exposed to a really high level of radiation, you are at increased risk for developing a cancer in the future. So there is a push to decrease the amount of radiation given during medical imaging. And that is the point of view I take in patients who have uh, kidney stones. 
All right, I've seen a number of patients that have lots, you know, they have repeated kidney stones, they have repeated flank pain, they have re repeated treatments for these stones that have struck the ureter. And uh, if a patient is gonna have 40 CT scans during their life, and they only have kidney stones, they don't have cancer already, right? You probably wanna try and lower the radiation dose as much as you can while still getting the information you need from the images to optimally treat the patient. Okay? So those are for patients that don't have a cancer, they have benign things that they're getting imaging for and they might get repeated imaging for, we try and lower the dose. For patients that already have cancer, the information that you get from these diagnostic imaging studies like CT or PET scans, the amount of radiation is actually quite low. And the information you get from the scan is really valuable. So I say optimize the value of the scan because if you're going to get a scan that's going to try and determine what treatments you're going to get or whether you're going to change treatments for your cancer, you better do the study right. And there may be a hypothetical risk of some cancer way in the future, but the information you get today if you treat your cancer correctly, it's going to far outweigh any hypothetical risk of developing another cancer at some point in the future. And I say hypothetical because we know with high doses of radiation, like we said, the atomic bomb survivors, there's definitely an increased risk of getting cancer in the future. What we don't know is that at low levels of radiation, do you have, an, do you have a small increased risk, right? People like to think, well, if you get a million units of radiation, you get this million units of increased risk. Well, what if I only got three units of radiation? Do I have three units of increased risk? And if you draw a straight line, you presume this linear relationship between radiation and risk, then that's what you would presume. But there's actually no evidence that that is the case. And we've never been able to show that patients getting diagnostic imaging are at higher risk of actually having cancer in the future. We're just, we use that Alara principle to say, since we don't know, we're gonna, whenever we can, we keep the radiation dose as low as possible. So for me, patients who have cancer, get your CT scans, get your PET scans as you need them in order to maximally guide your care because the benefit you get from the scans will far outweigh the hypothetical risk of getting some future malignancy that we don't even know if it's true that there really is a risk at low radiation levels. MR scanners don't have any ionizing radiation. There are different risks from MR. MR can cause thermal injuries from the, the again, the, when you, these magnetic poles that are produced in your body uh, are not entirely benign. But you, so you know that when you're talking about radiation, MRs have no radiation. CTs and PET scans and X-rays, things like that, have small amount of radiation. And then we get to things like PRRT, right? This is the radiation therapies. Also like external beam radiation, things that we're trying to treat cancer with radiation. Now, this is not no longer in the range of small amounts of radiation. These are huge amounts of radiation. I like to make the comparison of these uh, radiation therapies like PRRT or external beam radiotherapy. That's like getting an Olympic size pool amount of radiation and a CT scan or a PET scan is like adding a drop of water to the Olympic size pool. So if you've ever had PRRT or you've ever had external beam radiotherapy, to me, it doesn't make much sense to worry about the radiation that you're getting from a CT scan or a PET scan. It's one one millionth of a, of a, a factor of what you've already been exposed to. So if people routinely get PRRT or external beam radiotherapy to treat their cancers, then getting CT scans and PET scans really is, the amount of radiation is essentially very near zero. But be aware with PRRT and external beam radiation, because now you're getting a very, very high dose of radiation, those treatments do come with the potential risk of causing 
another cancer in the future. PRRTs are known about a 1% risk for a hematologic malignancy, a malignancy of the blood in the future. And external beam radiation has been associated with malignancies, particularly with sarcomas that occur in the bone or the, or the soft tissue. So, you know, should you be wary of the radiation through the principal bottom line, through the principal OARA? Yes. So don't get radiated unless the benefit of the radiation exceeds the risk of the radiation. If you have kidney stones, don't get a CT scan every time you have flank pain. You don't want 40 CTs for kidney stones. You don't want the hypothetical risk of developing a cancer just from treating the kidney stone. If you have a cancer, a neuroendocrine tumor, a breast cancer, lung cancer, get the imaging you need to optimally manage your tumor. That far outweighs any hypothetical risk from the radiation. And then if you need radiation therapy, right, you get the radiation therapy because the benefit of the radiation to kill your current tumor is so much higher than the risk that you have from developing another future tumor. So bottom line, don't get any radiation that you don't need, but if you need it, get it because both diagnostic levels of radiation and therapeutic levels of radiation have been proven to be ex extremely helpful in patients in managing cancers. Thank you for that. That's a really very clear explanation. I, I really like that summary. Get the imaging and treatment that you need when you need it, basically. So thank you for that really clear explanation of the radiation safety and what, how to weigh the risks and benefits around it. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, what do you suggest for those whose tumors don't show up on scans? What scans might you do for someone that doesn't have uptake on that gallium 68 Delta Tate PET CT scan? And what about those whose tumors don't show up on any scans at all? So there's the, the statement to each their own, right? In individual patients, one type of scan is gonna be better than another. For neuroendocrine tumors, the functional imagings tend to be better than anatomic imagings in many cases, but not all. So if you are uh, looking to do Lutathera, then you want to get that gallium dotatate or a similar PET scan. Because if the tumor is, does not take up the gallium dotatate or the gallium dotatoc or the copper dotatate, whichever one that you're using, it's not going to take up the Lutathera. Right, so you're using even the negative dotatate is really valuable because it's telling you to use a different type of therapy other than therapy targeted at the somatostatin receptors. FDG is really valuable in most patients for tracking treatment response. So if your tumor at baseline is FDG avid, you get a therapy, then you use a follow-up FDG to show that the FDG avidity has gone down. And that is more reliable than anatomic imaging with CT or, or uh, MR. But you know, what if you have a tumor that doesn't show up on dotatate or doesn't show up on FDG? Then you move to your anatomic imaging, right? There are low-grade neuroendocrine tumors that you may not see well on FDG PET, and then you need to measure size on CT or MR uh, in order to better determine whether the tumor is getting bigger or smaller with therapies. And what happens if you don't show up on any of those scans? Well, in general, if you don't show up on any scan, molecular, functional, or anatomic, your volume of disease is probably pretty low. So that's a good sign in and of itself, right? Because when things get big enough, they can usually be seen on virtually anything. So if you're so small, the tumors are so small that you can't be seen on anything, take that as a blessing right? And hope it stays that way as long as possible. But imaging is not the only way we track neuroendocrine tumors. We know that there are blood tests, uh, molecular markers that are used in addition. And of course, this is often how neuroendocrine tumors are initially diagnosed. So you have a symptom from a functional neuroendocrine tumor, and then you run a blood test, which shows something being secreted into the blood that says, oops, there's, there's something here that's not supposed to be here or is here in too high an amount that suggests a, a neuroendocrine tumor. And then you get the imaging to see where it is and, and how much of it is there. 
So if you can't be found on imaging, there are still other laboratory tests that can be used to track the extent of disease. And you know, for a patient that has a non-functional tumor that doesn't show up on any scans, again, I say count your blessings and, and hope it stays that way for as long as possible. Thank you for that. And we've really covered a lot of the scans here. So the last question really has to do with the reports. As you know, now in the day of electronic medical records, people can get their scan reports. So what suggestions do you have for patients who are trying to understand their scan reports? And to many of us, it's like Greek. So any advice would be greatly appreciated. I think I've done a different session on interpreting a scan reports, and I don't want to go into, I don't think we have the time to go into all of it, but know that reports are usually structured with different sections. That initial header telling you what the scan is and what was the methodology under which the scan was performed, a finding section that tells you what is seen, and then an impression section which is what the radiologist is trying to convey, what is the importance of those findings? So try not to get lost in the details of the finding section. There's often a lot of confusing words in there, often that have no clinical implication, you know, hemangiomas and, and things that are properly buried in the finding section. Go to that impression, right? That impression is kind of like your cliff notes for your report. And there are different strategies people employ for doing impressions. I think the two that are most valuable can be the TNM, tumor nodes metastases. Some people organize their the report. They tell you, do I see a tumor? Is the tumor getting bigger or smaller? Do I see nodes? Are the nodes getting bigger or smaller? Do I see distant metastases? Are they getting bigger and smaller? And then, of course, the distant metastases tend to be the most important element there. So if primary is getting smaller, the nodes are getting smaller, but uh uh-oh, there are new liver metastases, that's, take that as not a a positive uh, course. The other way that reports can be organized is that final statement, is there more disease, less disease, stable disease? For some tumors, stable disease is not a great thing. But for neuroendocrine tumors, I like to say stable disease is a wonderful thing. All right. Neuroendocrine tumors, if you can keep them from growing, patients tend to do well. So if you're getting her Lutathera treatments and you know, six months later you go get a PET scan or a CT scan and they say stable disease. Don't think that the therapy didn't work. The therapy did its job because without the therapy, the tumors could have been bigger. So a lot of patients who have therapies for neuroendocrine tumors, the tumors never shrink. But as long as they're not growing, that's a wonderful thing until we develop better technology to better treat the tumors that we face today. So on these reports, Read the first sentence so you know what type of scan we're talking about, and then go to the impression and look for that. Is it worse? Is it better? Is it stable? And better or stable are wonderful things for neuroendocrine tumors. As a final little tip, try and figure out what, when they say, hey, it's better or it's worse or it's stable, make sure you know what they're comparing it to, okay? Because particularly if you get your scans in different locations, right? You go to hospital A, you get one scan, you go to hospital B, you get another scan, you go to hospital C, you get a third scan. Imagine that, uh, uh, I'm going to oversimplify this, but on your pre-treatment scan at hospital A, they found 10 lesions. And then on your post-treatment scan at hospital B, they found three lesions, but they didn't have scan A to compare to. So they say, oh, we just see three lesions, but they can't say it's gotten better because they don't know it's gotten better. They don't have the comparison. Then you get another scan at hospital A again, and there are five lesions, right? Hospital A only has the first and the third scans, and they go, it's better, but it's actually worse compared to the second scan, right? So know what they're comparing it to 
because if there are missing scans, there's missing information. And that also means when you go to a different hospital to have another scan, try and be vigilant in making sure they have as much prior information, particularly the most recent scan available for their interpretation, because if they don't have those appropriate comparisons, they can end up making the wrong conclusions. Wow, thank you so much for all of this, your time and generosity and the way that you explain things in such clear and simple terms. You really demystified a topic of scans and understanding scan reports that's very challenging for many people. So we really appreciate your time. I've really enjoyed this. I could listen to you talk about this for hours, um, but I think we have to have an end to this podcast, but we really appreciate all your work in this field, your time with us, and just all your dedication to the neuroendocrine tumor patients that you see. Lisa, it's been my great pleasure to be here. Thank you for bringing attention to this important topic. And I wish my best to anyone who's listening here for their medical care or the medical care of their loved ones. Thank you again. Thanks for listening to the LACNETS podcast. We want to thank our presenting sponsors, Ipsen Pharmaceutical, and Advanced Accelerator Applications. For more information about neuroendocrine cancer, go to www.lacnets.org.